Good afternoon. Uh, this is actually one of those days of mixing motions. It's exciting because we're able to make an arrest. Um, it's also sad in the fact that you know we're remembering a victim, but the one thing is we are bringing justice to this victim and uh, her family. So we're very, very excited about that. Um, it's also exciting because of technology. Because of the use of technology, um, with our strong partnership with the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, who I cannot thank enough, um, this is the first time in the state of Florida we are making an arrest of a familial DNA. And FDO will be able to go further into that, but this just allows law enforcement to be even better in solving cases and to bring justice um, to victims and their families. Another one too is I want to thank our state attorney's office because they've been very helpful throughout this investigation. Um, and let me say, this has been a long investigation. And I will tell you how proud I am of our members of our sheriff's office and all law enforcement who worked on this because this truly was a team effort. I'm gonna go back in history a little bit. Uh, January 16th, 1992, at approximately 3 p.m., and I, I can't state the victim's name because of the crime that occurred, but there was a 17-year-old black female. She was walking down the, down the dirt road path, just getting off the bus from school. Um, she was brutally attacked. Um, it was a horrific scene out there. Uh, she was um, sexually assaulted, she was bludgeoned, and she was basically left for dead out there. And if it wasn't by the grace of God and her family, um, finding her when they did, she might have to cease at that scene. Our detectives did an unbelievable job working this case with what we had. And that's one thing to kind of point out. As the story goes on, it's not just about the investigation, but it's about the improvement of technology technology and law enforcement, especially with DNA, that has allowed us to get to where we are today. And it's interesting because so many people who are a part of, you know, here today with us, were actually there on the crime scene to investigate this. Um, Sergeant Dean Quinlan, who now oversees the major crimes unit that is solving this case, was actually out there holding the crime scene as a deputy out there. Um, as this investigation progresses forward, uh, Detective Jen Christensen got this case. She was um, out there, she actually produced some of the DNA, got some of the DNA and provided it to FDO Lee. One of our majors, John Corbin, was involved in this investigation also. He also submitted DNA um, to FDO Lee. So as you can see, this is something within our own sheriff's office that people played a vital role. Now let us keep going forward. Technology keeps improving. Even though DNA was submitted, because of the technology, because of markers um, that were needed back then, the amount of markers, less markers were needed, and that's a technical standpoint that FDLE can get further into, but it basically means that technology enhanced the way we looked at DNA, which means it gave us a better ability to go out there and track down who committed these crimes. So back in 2012, Detective Boyer, who's here and he can go further into this, he gets this case. He works with FDLE, works with the state attorney's office, and they start working the familial DNA side of it. Now familial DNA basically is the family. You know, everybody in a family has DNA that's connected to each other. So they basically provide the DNA off this case to FDLE and they start working it. They come back with a hit. The hit comes back to Jeffrey Crum II. That is the son of the suspect who was arrested in this case. Um, it comes back to him. He's serving a long sentence. Um, he won't get out until 2041 of state prison for numerous robberies. So now they have the DNA, they say, look, this isn't a suspect. However, somebody in his family is related to it. They go back to the Crum family. They speak to the grandfather, the father of the person who's in prison, and the brother. Uh, they all agree, they consent, they give us DNA. Uh, the DNA comes back to an exact hit on Jeffrey Crum, the suspect you see up there. Uh, match identically we were able to make an arrest. And I can tell you, his history, he has a long criminal history. Uh, sex bat, rape, robbery, and when this crime occurred, he was on probation. This is a very bad individual. There's, uh, I say, this is the information that we have, the way this is going, this is, this is stuff that's usually on TVs and movies. Um, however, we're blessed that we can use it now to solve these cases. I want to tell you a little bit. I spoke this morning with the victim, the victim's mother. I spoke with the victim's mother because when we talk about these cases, who usually gets the spotlight is the suspect. But I want to talk to her because after all this time, she deserved you know, to make sure that the story of her daughter is out there. 
the story of the victim. Because oftentimes, as I keep going back to, they're often overlooked. But I want our citizens, I want our viewers, everybody out there to listen to what kind of girl she was, what kind of person this victim was. Because when this goes forward, I want everybody to realize what an unbelievable evilness, hard individual Jeffrey Crumb was to do what he did to this poor girl. As I said, she was 17 years old. She was an honor roll student. She ran track and field. She was very big into her church. She actually got baptized um, in the area, in Atlanta Lakes. She was deeply engaged in her church. And that was the one thing her mother kept stress stressing out. She actually said to me in stage, she, was, she actually read the Bible every morning, and I know she read it before she went out that morning and before this brutal attack. She kept saying she is the daughter that every mother would want. And this horrific tragedy transformed her life. It was interesting when I said, I said, well, you know, we just start talking. I said, you know, I was telling her, you know, what, what, what was her life like? And she wanted to get into some of the details that happened that day. She said that she, the victim would always come home by 3 o'clock. And she says, I'm telling you, every day by 3 o'clock she was home. And I said, oh, okay. And I said, you know, why three? And she goes, because she wanted to watch General Hospital. She had to make it home to watch General Hospital. That was the time she was, it was, so when she didn't make it home, the family knew there was something wrong. So they notified the sheriff's office and they kept searching the area. They started walking all around. There was a, a vacant house down the street. They go to the vacant house and she says it was clearly by the grace of God and God's doing that they actually went to the back side of this house. And that's where they found the victim in a pool of blood. And I believe, and probably like anybody else, that if it hadn't been for the family, finding her then and getting her the assistance and her going to the hospital, she, she would have passed away. But she lived. The other side of the story, which is it's tremendous, is the fact that a couple years later, one of the Pasco County detectives actually worked with her on a sketch. And the victim was able to provide the sketch. This is back in 1995. This crime occurred in 92. But she was able to provide the sketch to give to law enforcement. Now, when you see the suspect, you match this up and you go, she did a really good job. It was phenomenal that, you know, after the trauma that she took, after the injuries that she took, she was able to do this. And, you know, I keep going back to the mother kept saying it's because of God. And she says, even to this day, her faith is extremely strong. She has a deep connection to God. And you know what? Maybe there was a reason all this happened. And as the mother said, she goes, I would have never believed 22 years later this would have happened. She goes, it was, it was clearly God doing this. And she said to us, she said, you know, you, you, the Pasco Sheriff's Office, law enforcement, you're truly God's angels. Because she said... Clearly that day, the devil went after her daughter. And now you were able to arrest him. And that's why I think it's so important we, we talk about these cases. We don't ever let a case go. We are, Pasco Sheriff's Office is fortunate. We just got a cold case grant. There are approximately 80 cases on that list. And if people are interested, please go to our website. Get us any information we can. Because with Sergeant Sess's unit, they're going to be going out there and keep looking at these cases because these families deserve justice. With DNA today, with technology, we're going to be able to make much more advancements. The one thing out there, Jeffrey Crumb, when our detectives talked to him, and, and he didn't really have to say much, and I'll let Detective Boyer go into that. But I know there's probably people in our community, there's probably people in the Tampa Bay region, throughout the state of Florida that committed crimes, and they've been living with them for years. Well, with this new DNA, we got another, another way to come get you. For the victims, for the families, we're gonna make sure justice is served. If you're a suspect, your door may get kicked in because your day of reckoning is coming. We will clearly come after you. And every day technology advances, that day of reckoning keeps getting closer and closer. We're going to come after you. We're going to continue to come after you. Technology's allowing that. And it's our persistency and relentlessness. 
because those families deserve it. Those victims deserve it. I, I, I can't say enough how proud I am working with FDLA of our detectives. This is one of those cases that clearly touched the lives of many of us. And for the victim and the family of the victim, you know, we're happy to bring them to justice. We know there are numerous other victims out there, families, that are seeing this and providing them hope. And my message to you is the information that we are obtaining from this case, we are going to look at other cases. We are going to work with other law enforcement agencies to see what else this evil individual had done. We are going to put all the pieces together and we're going to follow the facts. We're going to follow the information where it goes, but we're not gonna quit. We are gonna keep coming. And as I keep saying, your day of reckoning will be coming. With that, Detective Ward. Thank you very much, Chair. You know, I feel that this, uh, this investigation was like a relay race, and I just feel very fortunate and blessed to be holding the baton at the end of the race. Uh, my coworkers like Jen Christensen, Alan Proctor, and all those other uh, detectives in the Sheriff's Office who have um, taken a vested interest in this case over the years should definitely be recognized. I spoke with uh, the mother of the child in this case, and just like the Sheriff said, she is very happy with the Sheriff's Office and very happy that this case is resolved. Does anybody have any questions? We know that DNA kind of testing kind of got started in like the late 80s and it's kind of like a, it took a long time for it to really, I guess, help with law enforcement. What, can you like walk us through how that, how the technology changed since that time and how you're able to, you know, I know in 1992 it wasn't, it wasn't that strong yet, it's hard to use, I think. Well, in 92 I would have been 10 and I'm not a DNA <laughs> expert, uh, but I can tell you that the representatives from FDLE are here and uh, they have all of that information. For you. I can tell you that in this case I worked with the senior analyst Vicki Bellino who's not able to be here today. Uh, phenomenal, sharp, top-notch, and uh, just great. A great resource for our Sheriff's Office. Where was Crum when he, uh, he was arrested for this charge? He, he was at 3142 Darlington Road, which is the uh, Darlington Residential Treatment Facility. And what was his, I mean, had he been in jail recently? Was he, had he ever been arrested for other crimes? From his criminal history, he had some, um, I believe it was a, a robbery without a weapon charge in the 80s that we identified. And then we had a, uh, we didn't have a case, but these were in Hillsboro. Uh, Hillsboro also had a case on him in uh, maybe the late 80s, which he was arrested for carrying a concealed firearm and, and being a convicted felon. And then his recent history up until I think 2006, 2007 that you guys can see, is um, driving under the influence, driving on the suspended driver's license and stuff like that. So never a violent attack like this one? He had, been, he had been investigated for a sexual battery in Hillsborough County in 1985. And, you know, that's Hillsborough's case. Uh, we did obviously look at that to kind of set the baseline for us to have a good understanding of who he is. Was he surprised that after all this time you, you got him? Most definitely he was. Did he say anything to you once you arrested him? He completely denied everything. Um, took him into custody. And uh, he just basically denied it. He didn't acknowledge knowing the juvenile victim uh, or anything like that. Didn't associate with this case whatsoever. Did you tell him about the DNA connection? That if he did, what was the response? Most definitely. The number that you guys see on the probable cause affidavit, that one, the certainty level of 1 in 7.7 .7 quintillion yeah, quintillion is uh, 30 zeros. That's a big number. And uh, when we laid that out to him, he was he was he was shocked. You know, he knew what time it was. So is this the kind of thing where you, you run DNA from cold cases like every six months to see if you get hits? You know, if family's been picked up or uh, you know what I mean? It's a three-part system. The sheriff's office will have the cold case. You have to have a strong DNA, from what I understand. I can't speak on behalf of the experts. But the sheriff's office has to work with the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, people like Vicki Bellino, in conjunction with the state attorney's office uh, because the uh, submission of this familial DNA search has to be, um, you know, kind of granted by the commission. 
from what I understand, and that's the process that we went through in this case. But I mean, it was kind of lucky, right, that he, his son was in prison. If, if it hadn't been a hit, would you have run it, run this familial DNA search next year and then every subsequent year, and you know, in hopes that maybe someone related to him had been picked up or, or you know, had their DNA tested? Or, like I said, this case is literally a relay race. Detective Christensen, she did her work on the DNA. Major Corbin did his work on the DNA. And it just progressed to the point where we did submit it, and it would have been a progressive effort until the case was solved. This isn't a one-time shot. You know, and as this technology um, becomes better and better, and maybe faster, you know, I mean, the, the opportunities are great. Like the sheriff said, <coughs> you can't hide it from the system just by yourself. Now there's different opportunities for law enforcement to identify suspects. Did well, the victim suffer permanent uh, complications and injuries from the attack, and how was she doing now? You know, I'm not really able to talk about the victim given the seriousness of the, uh, the, the case at hand, but, you know, if, if you have the opportunity to discuss that um, with the family, um, you know, I, I, I believe that they would be able to explain that to you a little bit better. There were serious injuries, I can tell you that, which is very concerning, and I think you guys will have a good understanding of that when you have the conversation with the family. FDL, thank you. The expert. Thank you. 30 experts on DNA, if you want to come forward and explain the whole DNA process. And yeah. um, the familial um, search, in answer to your question, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, once a sample or a case has been submitted for familial searching, the policy is if there is no hits that are identified that lead to an investigative lead for the agency, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement will repeat that search every year until there is a solution to the case. Um, so that is an ongoing investigation. What familial DNA searching is, it allows us to use the convicted offender uh, or qualifying offender DNA database to identify potential suspects in a case based on the relationship that they may have to an individual in the database. Um, because the DNA is based on the fact that there is going to be an association that individuals that are related to each other are going to have certain characteristics of their DNA in common, if there is an individual in the offender database that is related to an individual who have committed a crime, the familial search has the ability to possibly identify that individual. It is, um, so once the hits have been identified, we will submit that information back to the law enforcement agency. They will have to then make the determination on whether or not that information is valuable to their investigation and then proceed with the arrest or the prosecution as warranted. Can you speak a little bit to the advancements of the DNA without getting too te te technical sure. in terms of basically where it was before and where it is today? Sure. Um, and, and this case is really a good example of how um, cases may be uh, benefited by DNA testing. At the time that the case, the crime occurred in 1992, DNA was in its infancy. Um, the testing that was available to law enforcement was a technology called RFLP, and that required a very large amount of DNA sample, and the DNA had to be in really good condition. As the science has advanced over the years, the technology has now advanced to the point that we can get DNA from very minute quantities of DNA and the DNA can be in very poor condition. So when the uh, case was first um, identified, when the crime was first occurring, that there was really no significant DNA available. As the years have progressed, in 1998, when FDLE first became involved in the investigation of this case, and we did the DNA testing that was available to us at that particular time, which was referred to as PCR technology. It had very limited discrimination value, but could be used to compare one case to another case to see if there was a possible link. In 2000, FDLE brought online the uh, STR DNA technology that is currently used to this day. It allowed us to produce a DNA profile that was subsequently entered into the offender DNA database, but unfortunately this offender was not a individual who qualified for his profile to be on in the database. So there was no hits identified. As the technology has advanced over the years, this case has basically stayed with us 
and we have continued to reevaluate the evidence as more, te uh, more valuable technologies become available. So in order for FDLE to conduct a familial search, the law enforcement agency, with a joint request from the state attorney's office, will submit a request for the familial searching. And we will then submit that request through channels to the DNA database. And in this case, the profiles were entered. There was an hit identified to, as it was said, the uh, son of the individual that was actually arrested. And then the arrest was made. Does the, does the DNA indicate only that there's a relationship, or can you identify that it was his father, for example? The familial searching is actually, the software is a specially designed software that allows for us to identify a um, parent-child relationship or a full sibling relationship. The software does not confirm or verify that there is actually a biological relationship. It only identifies based on the statistical probability that the profiles have enough in common that they may be from a related individual in that family. We then will do a testing called YSTR testing, and that testing is specifically based on the DNA in the Y chromosome, and it is passed from father to son unchanged. So by doing the Y testing, you can determine that if the individuals have the same Y DNA profile, they have to have a patrilineal relationship. They're related on the father's DNA cell line. Could you say and spell your name, please? Uh, my name is Melissa Suddeth. It's M-E-L-I-S-S-A-S-U-D-D-E-T-H. Detective Blair, what was your first name? David. David? Yes, sir. D-O-Y-E-R? Yes, sir. Could you say one more time where the suspect was arrested, where he was when he was arrested? He was arrested. Mm -hmm. He was arrested at the Darlington Residential Treatment Facility at 3142 Darlington Road in Holiday. Is that a rehab, a drug rehab? Or? It's a residential treatment facility can't necessarily talk about what he was in there for. Any other questions? All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.